Every student is unique. Every student learns differently and every student matters. This is Idea Exchange, the future of K-12 education series, brought to you by Macmillan Paston Smith Architecture. Who is responsible for success in schools? Is it the teacher, the parent, the board member? And what would you say is success anyway? For most of us, our experience in schools was this, sitting in a classroom and listening to a lecture, taking a break for lunch and physical activity, and then repeating. But for students today, that traditional model of school does not make sense for those entering the workforce or continuing on to college. Students today are expected to work together with peers on projects, expected to develop their critical thinking skills, and must have underlying technical knowledge about a whole array of topics. In short, the world needs different skills than it did 50 years ago or even five years ago. For many practical and beneficial reasons, the educational environment is changing to prepare students for these real world needs. Rather than it being someone else's responsibility, promoting ownership in one's own education is a starting point to create real opportunity. Teachers, parents, and administrators still play a vital role, but giving students choice in their own development has tremendous educational benefits. The Anderson Institute of Technology is a high school career and technical education program specifically designed to develop and promote student ownership. It does it in two ways. First, by providing relevant programs that are both college and career ready. And secondly, allowing students to take responsibility for their own development, to own their results. It's through that ownership that graduates from this institution learn skills, confidence, and leadership, and make meaningful impacts as adults. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Bob Couch, director of the Anderson Institute of Technology. Dr. Couch is a graduate of the University of Florida system, completing additional studies at both MIT and Harvard University. He has worked in both the private business world and in the public education sector during his career. Dr. Couch was an integral member of the team to develop the Anderson Institute of Technology and is today its director. Dr. Couch, thank you for joining us. Absolutely. The Anderson Institute of Technology is very different than what most of us would think of as traditional education, uh, or even for that matter, workforce development training. Uh, take us back a little. As you think about the school's development over the last several years, what were you trying to accomplish at the student level? I think you even have to go back to where and how education actually was developed. If you go back and look at the early years where it's primarily an agricultural-based system. And when you move into the 40s and 50s, uh, when the formal education was developed, is that, to be honest, is that education has continued in that model. Mm -hmm. So desk or in rows, the nine-month period of time of attending class was based on really on agricultural uh, harvest. Mm -hmm. And then in the fall, uh, students were out for a couple of weeks for a fall break to gather the harvest. In fact, in Vermont and Maine, in some of the school districts, that still is a practice today. So the traditional part of education that we started with is still alive and well today. I mean, our grandparents going back in the classroom today would see pretty well the same thing that they saw then. So I think part of the reform is how do you bring about reformation in education to meet the new demand as we moved into the uh, into smart technology, smart jobs, uh, you know, basically artificial intelligence, and looking at ways in which jobs have changed dramatically from where they were from the apprenticeship days, and so. That's the framework behind my whole belief about how education is really needs to change and should move forward in the future. Gotcha. Yeah, that's that's such a, an excellent point is that even through the agri uh, agricultural age, moving into the industrial age, even that even those um, classrooms are still the same as as most classrooms of what we would think of as traditional education. Um, right. Even today, I've lived through it as much as you've lived through it, but students aren't necessarily wanting to uh, be in, in that same kind of environment because the skills and the world is so different. 
um, the, that they'll be living in and that they'll be contributing to. Right. Um, so in that framework, in that setup, um, you, there's also uh, in that in that traditional type of education, more of a teacher led uh, approach to education, uh, whereas what you've been trying to do at the Anderson Institute of Technology seems to be more student led. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, how that happens, how that operates day in and day out? Well, my belief is that students own the, own the future and then to do that, they've got to own the present and they have to own the process. And so you can't you can't own what you want to become until you own the process of becoming. And so the whole framework of learning is and should be uh, student centered. Um, and that's been the, the challenge of transition is where you have teachers are trained basically by professors who lecture. Uh, they transition that into the classroom. And, and, and as a disclaimer, I mean, I think every student ought to pursue whatever their passion is, whether it's art, music, whatever it may be. Uh, it's interesting that we allow ownership of art and music, but we're not willing to give up ownership in other areas of, of education. And so I think that has been the, the process and part of what we've tried to do at AIT is that students need to own the present and own their learning in order to own their future and their career. And when that happens, motivation occurs. You don't have to prod and push students when they have passion about what they want to do. And how are you doing that programmatically? I mean, you're using some of the programs that you offer at, at AIT uh, to really drive that um, owning your own right. uh, and being responsible for your own educational path. How are, how, what are some examples of that inside of AIT? Well, I think, you know, the first thing you got to set the culture and then you have to be able to hire the teachers that uh, are able to adapt to a new way of learning. And so the process of learning at AIT is, is project based. And in that framework is that, that students then are engaged in their interests. They choose a career path in which they've got interest. And so when they come to AIT, we, um, basically have teachers and, and they have to be able to make this adaptation is they become facilitators of learning and not directors of learning. And they have to give up that ownership. And that's difficult. All teachers don't make it. I've had changes in the first year at, at AIT, the same way I did in my previous school. Some teachers cannot make that adaptation, but they have to do that. And then they become a mentor facilitator guiding students through the learning process and project-based learning. And in that framework is that, that students thrive and uh, they grow and develop. They get confidence, emotional, social development, and other things that are necessary for growth and development to be successful in life and on the job as well. Tell us a little bit about what you've seen as the result of that, because that is so different than what the 100, 150 years of traditional education. Right. What are some of the results you're seeing, seeing from that student uh, when you put them in a project-based environment like that? Well, we require the students to do a capstone project, and there's a framework around that. But within that framework, they have freedom. And so we want them to state whatever problem that they're going to try to resolve. Uh, it can be in a case where one student in biomedical sciences uh, created a flexible end of a crutch. And so when the patient walks on the crutch, it adapts to the terrain. And, and when, we, when they do that, they design it and they use machine tool or other areas in 3D printing to be able to cre create that solution. And every student has to present their findings of their project and their solutions in a public venue. So we have uh, public uh, events where parents and other people come in and review the projects and other people from the fields, medicine and other places, to be able to come in and review to see their work and give uh, feedback. Uh, Another case is that the health science students and machine tool students joined together in a project. Uh, they were able 
to create this lifelike mannequin. Uh, and we have Arthrex in the area, so they, they developed these artificial joints. So Machine Tool developed an artificial shoulder joint. Uh, I had an orthopedic surgeon to come in and lecture basically on orthopedics and joint replacement and so forth. And then we had four tables with four groups of students demonstrating the inserting of a um, artificial shoulder joint under the watchful eye of the orthopedic surgeon. Wow. His comment was, they went through exactly the same process I go through in replacing the joint. So kids have much more availability now, uh, current information on the internet, where they can see video productions of these different procedures. And given the opportunity, I mean, the, a lot of these you know, students probably are three, three, two, three, three students. They're not AP level. But given the opportunity to be creative, they do some unbelievable, unbelievable work. Uh, I had another student who has um, cerebral palsy, and he's he's in welding and cannot use his cannot use his left hand to hold the uh, rod to burn. So he goes on the internet, finds a solution where you can actually attach to your hand a device to enable you to be able to weld using that device to maneuver the arm that in fact is impacted by uh, CP. So, uh, you know, that's the kind of thing that can happen with students. And if they were remaining in their high school in traditional setting, you think about all they would miss. They'd be miss becoming who they are. And that's why kids a lot of times are wandering and are lost. Wow. That's, that's really uh, an interesting way to kind of think about it. Yeah. And gosh, a really good description of what's student led versus maybe just traditional uh, what we think of or what most folks think of uh, as as school. I, one question that I, that came up as as I was thinking about what you were saying was um, often, and this is what I meant by workforce development training being this institute being a little different in that way right. is it's not just necessarily one program. It sounds like you've got a lot of cross pollination happening between all of your programs um too and it's not just i'm going to go study welding or i'm going to go study nursing it's right. let's work together and and um and 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 see what we can do together right. uh, more than anything else what are some of the other what are what are all of the programs that are offered at the anderson institute of technology well we have weld from welding to aerospace engineering mm -hmm. and everything in between uh so we have biomedical sciences. Uh, we have you know, uh, three different wings, and that's part of the you know the plan and the construction facility. We have a manufacturing wing, technology wing, and human services wing. And so, uh, in the human services wing, you tend to have the health sciences, biomedical sciences, the ag science, vet science, as well as uh, cosmetology area as well. And on the technology wing, you have the cybersecurity, uh, networking, digital visual art, media tech, film, and the manufacturing, engineering, and, ma and machine tool, auto tech, and uh, electrical, mechatronics, those kinds of programs. And so what we try to do is to have a different programs connect. So engineering has you know the capability of doing 3D printing, uh, AutoCAD design, and so they can help students that maybe do not have the technical skill in the area develop projects and then actually produce them. So you'll see biomed students or other students going down the hall to engineering to get with engineering students, and most of the time it's the students that actually do the students' work. In other words, they give them the plan, engineering students draw it, and then they together do the 3D printing of it. So, uh, so the the pathway from the AIT is there. You know, you either go directly to work with certifications, you go to two year college and or four year. Uh, we have uh, students there that are AP. We have honors level courses, and 
even the technical programs that are in manufacturing very, very high level. All of our teachers, are, my machine tool teacher has patents and, and his background he's created for companies. So you have to have, to expect students to be at high level, you got to have faculty at high level. Sure. Right. I think one of my favorite areas of, of the facility is the incubator lab. Right. Um, and I think you, you, you mentioned a couple of things that are happening as a result of that, many, many patents and, you know, businesses that mm -hmm. might spring from that. Can you talk a little bit more about the incubator lab specifically and, and, and what, how, it, how uh, it is at the heart of maybe what you're trying to accomplish as well? Well, um, in my previous school, is uh, we had students that um, developed patent-level work, and we're having that, in fact, uh, right now at AIT. I think, the uh, obviously, the COVID has slowed that down to some extent. But the incubator lab serves uh, several purposes. One is we have our virtual reality uh, component in there as well, meaning that every program in the building can go in there and – the say for example if they want to you know look at a heart in from biomed or health science they can go in and actually project a heart into a 3d environment and with a wand they can rotate the heart they can look inside the heart even when they get inside and they touch the area where the heart is beating you can feel the pulsation mm -hmm. you can actually then dissect or uh, open up arteries. I mean, and so the same thing with auto tech. I mean, they can come in and do breaks uh, virtually. The other component is artificial intelligence, and we've in introduced that with a framework already with devices that can recognize different objects. And so you have an object on the floor, a tractor that can say, pick up squares or rectangles or whatever. And so if you want the robot to pick up only squares, then they will go and pick up only squares, bring them back and stack them, mm -hmm. which is sort of a basic function of, uh, of AI. Uh, and the third area is that it becomes the area where kids can bring projects into that lab and create a solution to a problem. And we're in partnership now with Bosch, and hopefully we'll have a person full-time in that lab that will then get uh, patents to the level of being able to not only incubate them there, but take them to the university, put them in an incubator there, and then create uh, a business out of that. It's so neat to see uh, what's going on in that incubator lab. It kind of just is uh, the culmination of of all the of all the parts bringing bringing uh, everybody together. It's, right. it's really very interesting. Yeah. So obviously, um, a, a facility like this does not come into existence overnight. It it it's it's different in the way that it approaches education. Um, and in fact, you've developed this type of facility. I think you mentioned this a, a little bit um, previously in, in the course of your career. This mm -hmm. is your sec second directorship at a facility um, uh, like this. Um, in that time, you've obviously learned a lot about um, uh, how students learn. But what would you suggest to others as they start to rethink their traditional mindset, rethink the way that they think about schools or programs in that way? Well, I think I think. First is you you have to really become somewhat of an innovative, uh, creative kind of thinker. Of is if you're looking at a, a traditional program machine tool, you have to think about how is going to be the best way. Uh, what kind of facility do you need to maximize it? The other is what kind of equipment do you need to to really take it to another level. Uh, what kind of teacher do you need? And uh, so you're looking basically at the environment uh, and the setting in order to come to, to an understanding of really what you want to accomplish. Uh, and I think, too, you have to be willing to try the unknown with some research. It's not, it's not running out there and throwing deep without knowing where the ball's going. I mean, you have to have some plan. But, and also to understand there has to be a defined culture around that because if you, own, if you own it, it goes back to the whole thing of ownership, 
if I'm the only owner of the culture, then nothing's going to happen. And so that transition of where the teacher has to come in and we have when we have faculty meetings, I ask them what is what is the new and different and creative thing you're planning to do in your classroom this coming year? You know, what did you do last year that worked and what did you do that did not work? Uh, and so we encourage that. Basically, I set up a facility where everybody in the building owns their area of responsibility. And it's like setting up a business is that my job is to provide you the resources you need to be successful in what you do. Um, and you own it. So you own your program. You own the enrollment. And, you know, so you can't blame it on someone else that, you know, the reason it didn't happen is because of you. No, it's not because of me. It's because you did not own it. You have to be able to own that. So, And then I think you have to have a branding. Mm-hmm. Is You know, we have Sophie, which is uh, – a symbol of artificial intelligence and 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 wisdom and thinking and so forth and so uh, we we use that uh, logo and brand. Uh, our parliament, uh, we have a, a, a coffee bar area there, and that is to develop social emotional development. And uh, our mascot is the owl. A group of owls is a parliament. Mm-hmm. And Parliament is that you have discussion and debate and interaction and and so forth. So faculty are out there in that environment. The third uh, the third framework of that is that I believe, and this was based upon my trip to Europe, trips to Europe, is there has to be collaborative space. And so again, we get back to the construction piece of a facility. And so at AIT, we have the collaborative space, and you'll see students out there in non-COVID times involved in collaborative learning around the smart uh, board uh, in a leisurely kind of way of learning. And so you learn outside. You see kids outside the facility, uh, as I saw yesterday, out doing different kinds of things based upon their program direction. So that is that sort of the overall is that students have to feel and own the building too. They have to own that environment. It has to be very inviting. It has to be friendly. And our our students are very relaxed. I think they would say it's you know it's it's fun to be there, and I think learning can be fun. And so uh, so I think that's the setting that that mm-hmm. drives the motivation in learning. Right. And you had a, a tremendous amount of, of help, not only educationally with, with the school district and the administration, but what I, what, I, what I gather as we go through and walk through the facility is this true sense of public-private partnership right. uh, as well. Um, could you walk us maybe through some of your business um, partnerships that you developed along with this facility? I might start with Michelin right. um, because Michelin, um, as I understand, has about a thousand or more employees employees in the county that that AIT uh, is in, and and they have written before in the past, and I'll just read this Mm -hmm. uh, to you to talk a little bit about it, but uh, Michelin, what they say about it is that Michelin is is proud to be a partner uh, with the Anderson Institute of Technology to help develop the workforce of tomorrow and connect students with many opportunities a career in manufacturing provides. Since the start of the partnership in 2019, Michelin has trained more than 30 of your students uh, through uh, the Youth Apprenticeship Program and welcomed more than 20 students as a full-time employee uh, after completion of the program. Michelin says, we look forward to continuing to partner with AIT and as we boost economic mobility uh, and the growth in the community together, which I thought was just a wonderful statement about what the business aspect of that partnership has uh, has come to fruition on, on. Could you talk a little bit more about Michelin and, and your other partners that you developed along the way? Yeah, and I think, too, is uh, the how the institution came into being. It's, it was by penny tax. Mm-hmm. And Superintendent Wilson and Anderson 5 brought together the other two districts, uh, districts three and four, that form, that feed students into the facility. So that includes a broad range of connections to industry around in the greater uh, Anderson County area. So uh, Michelin has plants that connect uh, and impact uh, all the school districts. 
Uh, yeah, Michelin's a great partner. Uh, they've donated probably a hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of equipment and funds and named the wing and uh they are very very active very engaging very supportive uh i I think the challenge sometimes you have is is you have businesses that maybe contribute and are not altogether involved um uh, most of our partners are, are involved, and we have apprenticeships at those sites. So we love to have the business partners really involved. We have uh, the 20 programs. We have 20 advisory committees, and we have probably 120 members uh, from the business community involved in those. I have uh, my own uh, advisory council. I have 20 members from industry on that council as well. So we try to reach out and engage every way we can with business and industry to, to meet those those needs. And when that partnership exists uh, in a way that I think, one, there has to be trust where what we're saying we're going to do, we do, and that we prepare students so the responsibility is increased when you get into that arena with business and industry because – uh, sometimes industry may not have a favorable look on in regards to education. So we, we take that very seriously and we've been very successful with it. That's great. You know, what are you excited about, uh, moving forward? I, I think, uh, the, cre- the, the creativity that's coming out of it, um, I, I would imagine is, is pretty exciting day in and day out. What are you excited about the future for, uh, programs at, at Anderson Institute of Technology? Well, when I made the decision several years ago to come out of ministry, I took a 65% cut in salary <laughs> to go into education, but, but, uh, and I think I came I came into education truly believing that that you know I had the foresight and wisdom to be able to make a difference coming out of industry. I think the next phase of development is going to be culinary arts. Um, the that program was looked at originally, and it was before I got there. Um, it was decided not to to put it in, but the demand has been over the last couple of years from. Uh, community and from uh, the schools and districts that we needed it. That program will drive a lot of things because we'll be enabled then to have uh, events. Uh, when I in my previous school, we had about ten thousand visitors through a year from all over the country. We've had international teams coming in and look at that facility. Uh, we had also events where we uh, did an event on workforce development and had you know 250 people and they they pay a registration fee and i bring in leading workforce development folks and and a part of that is culinary art supports that and so we fed uh, probably 5,000 people a year through my previous facility and i would assume that would be the case here uh, in anderson uh, with our program there as well There'll be a two pathway there. One will be through bacon and pastry. The other will be through culinary arts. Um, the goal there will be to produce leaders in the food industry, meaning that uh, they will become managers or they'll become chefs. They'll become a bacon and pastry uh, chef or culinary chef. We will partner with local uh, restaurant groups uh we'll also partner with uh, those in greenville and uh we will engage them the same way we've engaged our industrial partners uh so there's a pathway to a career in those fields uh and students enter in at very high level and uh, become certified in there and graduate either going into culinary institutes or greenville tech has a program but they would continue post-secondary studies as well. Gotcha. Well, this this has been great. Um, I, there are a lot of things um, that 
that we would want to, you know, give our listeners uh, resources for, uh, whether that be project-based learning or more about the Anderson Institute of Technology? Are, so, are there some things that you think people should um, read or any resources that you're aware of that would be helpful um, in, in those for those that want to learn more uh, about these topics? Yeah, I think first would be, uh, I think it'd be worthwhile for them to take a tour, a virtual tour of of AIT, uh, they can go to Anderson Institute of Technology website, uh, and we have a, a virtual tour. Uh, they also can connect to program areas within uh, that connection. And as a part of that, uh, they also are video, program videos that they can see as well. So they can get a, a bird's eye view uh, of what we do there and also uh, faculty speak as well as students so they'll get a sense and flavor of what I've talked about here. I would say uh, Georgetown University Center for Education and Work is probably uh, one of my best resources in terms of you know where is the workforce, what kind of education uh, do people really need to move into the future economy uh, and I, that's probably one of the main, uh, my main sources to stay current. Um, you know, and I would encourage people to, and there's a lot of courses offered. Uh, when I got involved in, 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 in the artificial intelligence, uh, I took uh, a program at, through, at MIT. Uh, I, I think you have to know what you're talking about, and I think the way you do it is you go educate yourself about it. Um, looking at facilities and how they impact education. Uh, I took a course, uh, a couple courses at Harvard and, and it focused on the fact of how you create the internal environment in a facility to create this sort of urge for learning. And it's much more kind of informal, you know, it, it's kids on, uh, you know, they're lounging and reading and rather than sitting in desk and reading. And so it's a whole different concept. And I, th I would say overall, the biggest impact that you can have everything, all the innovation, all everything to make learning fun. But if you don't have the facility that is inviting to where it emphasizes and supports what you want to do, it still will not be effective. It has to be throughout the entire system, including the facility, to where uh, kids see the facility matching the culture. And how's that working out at Anderson it's working Institute out great. of Technology? I mean, I think uh, I hear from kids all the time. They want to stay there all day. We're on a schedule <laughs> three hours morning, three hours in the afternoon. They go back to their feeder high school. But I think if uh, the majority of the kids, if they had their choice, would stay there all day. Gotcha. Well, thank you very much for sharing your perspective this morning. I, I'm, I'm really interested to see what happens next. It's only been open for two years, right? right? So uh, this is an exciting program, not only for um, for Anderson uh, and, and the community that, that's being served mm -hmm. by it, but this is just a, a tremendously innovative facility that I think we all can learn from um, as architects and planners, as educators in South Carolina and the Southeast. And so I just really appreciate your work with it. And thanks for joining us today to talk more about it. Absolutely. And thank you for the opportunity. And we invite visitors to come and take a look. Thank you. Okay. Idea Exchange, the future of K-12 education podcast series is brought to you by Macmillan Pastant Smith. The K-12 studio at Macmillan Pastant Smith is focused on helping schools prepare future ready students. Have a question or a topic you'd like to address? Please complete the contact form listed in the episode description. Thanks for tuning in to Idea Exchange, the future of K-12 education series. This series is recorded at Bramble Jam Studios in Greenville, South Carolina. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss our next episode.